welcome back to Loving Grit. My name is Laia. I'm Justin. And I'm Rachel. And might I say, if you have missed the last few episodes, you're missing out on some of the greatest and most amazing Philadelphia stories that you never knew existed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, make sure you caught up and subscribe. Today's show is all about getting to the root of festival life, and we call in the big bosses. Our first heavy hitter is one of Philly's proudest sons, mega manager and Live Nation urban president, Sean G, joins us to give us the latest on the Roots Picnic. Also joining us is the man behind Welcome America Festival, CEO Michael Del Bain. I know, you need this information, so let's get started. Time for that lightning round of Philly faves. And this week, let's do Philly-based but nationwide products. Easy. Reed is water ice or water ice. I mean, the cool treat you can get anywhere. I love like being somewhere else in the country and getting a Rita's and it tastes exactly like the lemon taste right here. Well, I'm gonna pair your Rita's with hers potato chips because we're doing a lot more snacking these days and mm -hmm. that's my first thing <laughs> to grab. So I'll go with hers. Well, I will match your hers with Philly's own wrap snacks because I always get excited anytime I'm in another city and I see a bag of those chips and of course he always partners up with like some of the best hip hop artists. So, brass snacks. All right, y'all ready to get this show started? Let's, Let's get in. Sean G is the epitome of an amazing Philadelphia story. He coined his management skills thanks to legendary Roots manager Richard Nichols and evolved it into not just the manager for the Roots and Jill Scott, but business manager to the likes of Drake, Nicki Minaj, Meek Mill, Lil Wayne, and a slew of others mm. thanks to merging his rock from the top. No, no, no. That's just such an impressive list. I know. He's a mean. And a slew of others. <laughs> Thanks to merging his roster with Maverick Management. And can you believe he's also the president of Live Nation Urban and a few other entertainment businesses? It's a lot. I know. But today, let's start with the Roots Picnic, which he has produced in Philly for over a decade. We're also excited for this show, Sean. Oh, likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Let's just talk about Roots Picnic, 13th year, and this is the first year we're going virtual. It's interesting because, you know, we went 11 years down at Festival Pier where the picnic started. And I think we might have had like 2,200 people the first year down at Festival Pier where they had that existing stage up. And each year it, it, it grew incrementally. You know, each year it was, OK, we're going to get more people here what parking lot can we take over, right? <laughs> and it got to a point where we put stages up in, in so many adjacent parking lots that we were bursting out at the seams. And then last year, we finally, myself and Jeff Gordon and the city of Philadelphia finally came to an agreement where we could move into the park because that's where we wanted it to be. Me, Tariq, and Amir grew up in Philly, going to the Platte on Sundays, mm -hmm. hanging out in Fairmount Park. So we always wanted it to be there. But number one, we, we didn't have the scale in the early days to actually warrant a Fairmount Park uh, event. And then number two, we had to, you know, work our way through politics and logistics. So last year we got to the park and it was, it was an amazing experience. This is a little frustrating, right? You got your like perfect, perfect it, it, setup. Beyond frustrating because this year we were popping. Like last year we did like 28,000 tickets, doubled our normal capacity that we had. We, we can only sell 15,000 down at Festival Pier. That was the max. So we would always sell out every year. Last year we doubled the capacity, but this year I had 20,000 tickets sold in March. We were literally doing site maps, building out site maps and capacity analysis to see, can we get 40, 50,000 people there on that day? Because we had that type of a demand for that one day event. But what a lot of people didn't know behind the scenes, I had been working for probably six, seven months on announcing a second day for the picnic. So we oh, were going to go, wow. we were, we were on sale for Saturday and we were going to go Sunday. And the headliner for that second day was a lady by the name of Michelle Obama. Oh my gosh. Oh my so, goodness. So we had a deal already locked and we were putting the creative together and talking about the announced plan. So that first week post COVID when we all were depressed, I was super depressed. How long did it take you to even get the clearance and approval for Michelle Obama to participate? Um, we started talking, I believe in like November. You know, I had this, wow. you know, kernel of an idea. We've always had a good relationship with the Obama team. The Roots campaigned pretty aggressively for Barack Obama. And then our position in The Tonight Show, the Obamas both have come up to the show frequently over the eight years they were in office and slow jamming the news with both of them and skits. And then, yeah, I mean, 
in the last, I'd say, three months of their residency in the White House. We performed at one event, which was the BET uh, Love and Happiness event. And that was like the best night of my life. But then the second, the last party, I was blessed to be able to produce that event for them. And Questlove was the DJ for the after party. So, you know, the relationship was there and we reached out and it was a, uh, okay, let me see, let me see. And then they came back and said there was interest. So, you know, was we built, you know, the voter registration piece that was going to be. Yeah. Passed? Yeah. Yeah. It was always, it was always part. It was in partnership with when we all vote. While COVID made this change, do you see an upside now because more people will be exposed to this virtually? I know you're disappointed that the actual picnic isn't happening, but the fact that more people have access yeah. to this with what's going on with Black Lives Matter right now, do you think in some ways it plays to your advantage? I mean, yes, definitely. I want to expand the brand. We want to expand the brand. This is going to give opportunity for people who have never been to the picnic just because of their pure location situation that, you know, they'll be able to experience a small little bit of the picnic. But for us, what's more important is we're using our platform to sort of engage, inform, educate young voters about the importance of using their voice and using their vote. Like that's the, that's the parallel. That's the why of it all. You've always been an entrepreneur an innovator and finding ways to oh, truly you. make no of course tr finding ways to truly make an impact on the culture so for you is it that you typically map out hey these are my goals this is the bucket list this is how i can make a difference or do you see you know the, here's where gaps exist let me see how i can make sure i fill those voids like what's your approach I've always been goal driven, but you also have to be reactive too, right? So while you're going and building and when you're trying to figure out how to reach your goals, the goals that you set for yourself, you got to pay attention to what's going on in the marketplace because you got to be reactive while you're being proactive, if that makes sense. So, you know, I've been blessed to just work with some super creative people. I came into the game. I was a banker. Yeah. Can you give us your Philly backstory? Uh, Philly born and raised, you know, Central High graduate. I was like a lot of young kids during that period in time. I played basketball. I had a basketball dream. I got a basketball scholarship to Millersville University. Went up to Millersville. My basketball dream ended quickly. I got hurt and I had my first son. So I was a 19 year old father. That really made me shape up and, and focus on life. After graduating from Millersville, I moved to DC. I got my MBA in finance and investments from George Washington University. This was the mid 90s. So it was, you know, when you were in business school, it was you had two paths. You were either going to the banking world and Wall Street, or you're going to be a consultant, or you were a failure. You was a waste of time. I chose the, the first path. I, I took a job at Citibank, private bank. I was a private banker in New York. I had an office in Zurich, Switzerland. I was spending. Jesus. Us. Two weeks out of each month in Europe and two weeks in my New York office. Wow. Um, I was living a dream, right? But what I quickly realized, I wasn't living my dream. I was living mm -hmm. someone else's dream. You know, I had my son who was back in Philadelphia that those two weeks when I was in Europe, I hated it. <laughs> you know, when I started really getting into, you know, building my book of business with the bank, I really didn't love what I was doing. All the yeah. while, this is the 90s, so all the while, you have a cousin named Tariq who's rising absolutely. with his group called The Roots. No, absolutely. You know, I was the cousin that, you know, used to always come to the shows and get the backstage pass and eat up all their food and drink up all their <laughs> liquor. And, and, but then I, I would leave early before the after party because I had to work or I had school the next day, right? So fast forward to my time at the bank, I received a call from my brother, my partner, my mentor, Richard Nichols. He was mixing a record from the Jazzy Fat Nasties in New York at Sony Studios, which was like 10 blocks from my office. And he was like, yeah, can you come by the studio after work? I was like, yeah, sure. Came by, or I'll never forget, I walked in the studio. You know, if anyone knows Rich, he was the ultimate fifth Beatle when it comes to the roots. You know, he was the sort of creative center of not only the roots, but of Philadelphia's music scene of the quote unquote neo soul scene globally, you know, it all sort of emanated from this man. And he just was like, yo, I need you to come on. I need you to work with me. And I was like, I got a job, dog. Like, you know what I mean? I worked down the street. And he was like, I don't care. Just figure it out. So <laughs> I sort of stepped in without a real role, you know, but my role was to do the business side of management 
while that freed up Richard to focus on all of the creative and, and, and visionary aspects. So I literally was working at the bank 12 hours a day. I'd be in the office. And I remember a time where it was like nine o'clock at night and I looked up and I was like, I've been doing roots work all day. I got to focus on my bank work. And that's when I realized it was like, I found my passion. And a couple months later, I said a prayer. I talked to my mom. I said, I know what I want to do. And again, at this time, I'm 24, 25. That's a huge so leap I just, off yeah, of a I very comfortable faith. cliff. Yeah, I jumped out on faith. You know, I took a huge pay cut, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> like a significant pay cut. But, um, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, it was, uh, I'm 21 years later, 22 years and, later. We're here. And so to like, it's interesting because like to fast forward, because you have chapters in your life, like you fast forward, you, you first started the business manager to the roots. Then you kind of became the co-manager. Then, you, of course, the Jill Scott. Then, of course, your business management grew i'm sorry i'm telling your own story but tell me if i'm wrong <laughs> then your business management grew and all of a sudden there's like there's little wayne there's yeah. Nick Minaj. it's interesting it's a study in in relationships right because i came on with the roots i didn't really have a role i just did a little bit of everything but i looked up in in one of those music 101 books and i was like oh i handle the money i'm a business manager right but <laughs> i also handled the touring i also handled all of the business associated with the label so i was more i was a manager but i didn't have a title because rich was the manager so i was like i'm gonna call myself a business manager my second client was a young lady by the name of jill scott from philadelphia i knew jill she went to girls high I went to central so we went back to high school days but at the time when she started her career, her husband was managing her and they were both green in the industry. They knew I work with the roots. They came in and was like, yo, can y'all, can you just help me out? What was my role? Okay. I know money. I know touring. I got some relationships. Cool. I'm gonna help you out. Her husband was the manager. So I didn't really have a title, right? Me and Joe called ourselves and still call ourselves to this day, business partners. But then it was my third client that Laia referred to that really set my trajectory from an overall business perspective, I got a call from a young lady, a lady in LA who said, you know, hey, my son just recorded a record. He's a producer. He knows nothing about touring. His manager and, and, and his business manager, they know nothing about touring. And I heard that the Roots have the most organized, well-run touring business in the game. Can you come out? I want to interview. They interviewed like three or four people and they hired me on the spot. And the lady was Donda West and her son was obviously Kanye West. It was interesting because... With the Roots and Jill, I didn't have a defined role, but I had, you know, I was like, all right, I'm handling the money, I'm handling the touring, so I can call myself this. With Kanye, he had a business manager, he had a manager, he had a lawyer, he had all of this sort of the traditional roles that an artist should have. I just came in just like, what's up? You know what I mean? I was a touring consultant, <laughs> you know, I worked with everybody on the team and I really helped. Yay, we started, the first tour I did was, um, the school spirit tour, which was a college tour associated with college dropout. And I worked with him all the way up through um, the last tour I did with him was um, watch the throne. So we went from clubs and colleges on up through arenas and stadiums. But I say it's a, it's a lesson in relationships because when I walked in that room, that first time, that first meeting, you know, he had a management team and here's his mother walking me in. Here's this guy that's going to join our team and at the time, I was managing the roots, <laughs> you know, so they're looking wow. like, what's up with that? But we quickly bonded. His manager was a guy named G. Roberson and Al Branch. We quickly realized like one plus one equals four. You know, I was able to come in and build touring. That's something they didn't have to think about. So they were able to build marketing and records and the legacy that is Kanye West. They were able to focus on that. You know, they're my partners to this day. So that led to Lil Wayne, to J. Cole, that led to, to Drake. and So and, touring and is your life. Um, touring is my passion. I mean, you know, so what's it like to have your passion put on hold right um, now with COVID? Again, it was, it was frustrating. Going back to that first week, in addition to the Roots Picnic, I have a festival that I partnered with the city of Miami called Miami Jazz in the Gardens. This is my first year partnering with them. I had Mary J. Blige and Jill Scott and, mm. and Anthony Hamilton and Charlie Wilson. And it was popping. It was that it was March 14th, 15th. We had to cancel that. We need to tell everybody that Sean is also the president of Live Nation Urban. So any type of soul, hip hop, R&B, gospel situation that's a tour or a festival, that is Sean G responsible for that. It was sort of like undoing everything that I've worked on for the last eight months. So it was it was tough. It, it wasn't easy. At this point in your career, 
Do you ever receive pushback when you're like, you know what, I have this great idea. We really should be doing X, Y, Z. The people that you work with, do they sometimes say like, "Uh, I don't know, or are you like the golden child? Is it that Sean said it, we're doing it. Like this is a no brainer. Even if we don't get it, we know the results are going to be what we need for our business. Absolutely not. You know, absolutely (laughs) not. I work with, as I said, the core of my business, the foundation of my business are three people, Tariq Trotter, Amir Thompson, and Jill Scott. We go back and forth on group text, ideas, arguing, you know what I mean? What about this? I mean, the roots, we overthink everything. So everything isn't just a, a slam dunk, but it is those conversations. It is those conversations between Jill and I about why she shouldn't be doing something or why she thinks she should be doing something that really shapes the really, really sort of super creative ideas that actually come out on the other end. But it's definitely not a, not a Sean G or nothing. Even with my team, everybody has a voice. And for me, it's like, I need all of your voices. That collective mind share is the thing that brings out these amazing ideas. I love that. Sean, I have to ask you the question. What does love and grit mean to you? Love and grit describes Philly. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in Philly and, and the city of brotherly love, sisterly affection. There's a lot of love there. There's a lot of family. There's a lot of friends. But I also have a network of Philadelphians that have left Philly that I still keep in touch with. And we often talk about what is it about Philly that makes us special? And it is the grit. It is the it is the blue collar nature. It is the roll up your sleeves and, and let's work hard. So love and grit, you know, that's that's Philly. Thanks so much for joining us. And we can't wait to see the first virtual Roots picnic. I can't wait to see it. It's funny. When we, when we released the press release. We got on my, our first sort of production Zoom post press release. And we were like, yeah, we got a, a good, good response. Now we got to just produce a show. Right. So it's different for me. You know what I mean? I'm used to producing festivals and events and I'm sort of in that rhythm. This sort of took me out my rhythm and I'm learning again. So I, I really, I'm really enjoying this process. I don't think virtual ever replace live. You know, I think, you know, that emotional connection that you get when you see your artist, your favorite artist. I miss concerts the most. Yeah, you you can't, it's not going to replace it. I do think what's happening is there's a different level of engagement from a consumer behavior perspective with sort of digital events, right? I think COVID has forced us to be uncomfortable and do things that we probably wouldn't have done. I joke with my wife, I say, I probably would have not, sat on a couch and watched two people on Instagram live for two hours, play music back and forth. You know, right. that, that might not have ever, you know, been part of my, my, my thing. But I think what's happening is you're seeing this consumer behavior open up and you're going to see almost like a cottage industry develop that incorporates this sort of digital live experience that will augment the, the real live experience. So what do I have to do to get tickets to the Roots picnic? <laughs> you dog on to the Roots YouTube page and hit subscribe. And then you will get a notification at 6 p.m. Eastern on June 27th to just click and watch. And text ROOTS, R-O-O-T-S, to 56005. That will allow those non-registered voters to register to vote. All right, you guys, so tis the season for virtual festivals and some of the biggest will take place in Philadelphia. Welcome America has got to be leading the pack with 50 scheduled virtual events. What does that look like? What is a virtual event? Let's ask the boss, CEO Michael Delbane. How could we ever predict that you would have to take Wawa Welcome America virtual for the first time and put 50 events together virtually? What has that been like? Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned 50 events because one of the things that our team was really committed to was making sure that when we went virtual, that that didn't translate into a significant reduction in what the city of Philadelphia was gonna get from Wawa Welcome America. So as we're preparing to launch, we've got seven days, over 50 programs. We've got a concert every night, and then we've got the concert on July 4th. So our big commitment was making sure that sure, You know, we're going to reimagine this festival and we're going to do it virtually so that everybody can stay safe. But it's also a really robust lineup of programs. And we were really, really committed to that. And then we had another factor play in, right? Black Lives Matter. This has really 
change the way people look at the Declaration of Independence and how this country was founded. And, you know, we celebrate Juneteenth, but July 4th is, you know, called Independence Day, but not Independence Day for everyone, which hold we- on, were, let me just had his moment. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just had his moment of two white men that just about to talk about Juneteenth. This is so exciting. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Michael. So that had to make a huge impact too on your programming. It really did. And Welcome America has always been fiercely committed to creating space in our festival to allow diverse voices to come together and be part of the celebration. But to your point, the relationship between the city of Philadelphia and our nation and this holiday is a delicate one because it's not the same experience for all Americans. And I think that this year we wanted to redouble the effort to make sure that we created space for diverse voices to continue to be heard. But we also wanted to pause and acknowledge that ongoing struggle of a relationship between our city and this holiday and recommit ourselves in the years to come to do it differently, to do it better, and to make sure that we continue to understand that this is an ongoing conversation. The period is not on the sentence yet. And if every July 4th we stop and we think about how we can make our nation better for all Americans and for every voice to be heard, then we're doing our jobs. And that's what we've committed ourselves to this year. And just in case anybody who's tuning in right now doesn't understand what Michael's saying in that way of understanding and taking a moment, we should know that 1776 people were still enslaved for an, almost another 100 years. Juneteenth, June 19th is actually the day that Black folks celebrate real independence because 1865 was the year that Black folks were really free from that one lone town in Texas. But that's great that y'all are considering that, Michael. Absolutely. And we want to, you know, we want to use the reach and the voice of Welcome America to shed light light and share education and bring more awareness around Juneteenth. And so in the coming years, we are an incredibly established festival. We've been around for 28 years. We've got a great following. It's incumbent upon us to use that reach and to use that voice to educate people about July 4th, 1776, but also about Juneteenth and about other holidays that are important to, again, including all Americans in celebration. And we know you have a lot of when we speak to the programming and especially, you know, things that really resonate with different communities, diverse communities. I know last year you started the Gospel Choir series and that's returning. I know you always have major headlines. Can you tell us a little bit more of that and what that will look like for people? Absolutely. So to your point, Hymns and Harmony, our gospel concert, will be back again this year. It'll be on the evening of June 28th. And gospel over the past couple of years has really come to play an important role in the Wawa Welcome America Festival lineup. And we wanted to make sure that we preserved that event, not only because it's immensely popular and, and a heck of a lot of fun, but also because it is an opportunity for, again, those divorced voices to be heard and to be part of our celebration. At the same time, we are creating a bunch of opportunities this year to put together stages that are going to feature local artists, multicultural, multi-generational, diverse local artists. So on July 4th, for example, in the afternoon, the day is going to really kick off with the Pennsylvania Lottery Groove Stage, which is a stage that is going to highlight local artists performing you know, socially distanced from the, from the safety of their homes, but it's gonna be a platform to allow small artists, smaller local artists who probably wouldn't have an opportunity to be part of the July 4th concert on the Parkway to have a platform to perform. And then following that, immediately before our main event on July 4th will be the Chill Moody music stage, the Chill Moody music experience. And Chill is obviously such an incredible voice as a local artist here in Philadelphia and really an ambassador for local diverse artists here. So he's going to curate his own stage and he's going to bring local artists forward to give them the opportunity to perform on July 4th with the eyes of the city and the eyes of the world on Wawa Welcome America. So it's opportunities like that that we're really proud of. Not only having these big important signature events, but also going down and giving a microphone and a platform to local artists to also be featured. Okay, so we have the local artists covered. 
I don't think you answered my question about the headliner. And Jason the Derulo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, we are so humbled and so proud to have two mega artists headlining our July 4th concert. It will be the incredibly stunning Grammy, Emmy, and Tony award winning and Oscar nominated Cynthia Revo, who is just spectacular. And Cynthia Revo is going to be performing on stage at the Met with the Jazz Orchestra of Philadelphia. She has got an incredible songbook prepared of selections that just amplify the voices of diversity and the voices of everything that is relevant today. And then the concert, as always, ends with a party. And you've got Jason Derulo, who is just a multi-platinum hit, hit maker, um, who's going to come out and bring the house down. So we are, we are so fortunate to produce our July 4th concert in partnership with Live Nation, who is it's just spectacular in bringing world-class talent to Philadelphia year after year after year. This year, when we knew that the festival was going virtual and we weren't going to be able to build a, a massive stage on the parkway, Live Nation stepped up and opened their doors and said, bring the performance to the Met the legendary Metropolitan Opera House on North Broad Street. And so what you see when you are sitting at home, the comfort and safety of home on NBC 10 is going to be happening live in Philadelphia. And that's unique because that it might be, I don't, I don't want to speak unequivocally, but it might be the first live music performance in Philadelphia in a long, long time. There've been a lot of concerts from home. There've been a lot of concerts that are pre-recorded, but this is happening in real time live from the Met. So what you're seeing is happening as you see it. And that is really, really exciting. We don't forget, we have phones, we have our tablets. I mean, it's 2020. So even if it means that you want to sit in the grass and, you know, have food outside and watch a performance, there's still ways for us to maneuver and adapt, being that so many things have changed. You know, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to sit inside your home. Well, we have a little tagline this year that says stay in and go all out. And you can really bring the party home and watch Cynthia Rebo and watch Jason Derulo in your backyard while you're barbecuing. Exactly. And it's really a celebration of Philadelphia and it's a celebration of resiliency because this is a scenario where Philadelphia is beginning to feel a little bit back to normal, right? Because mm -hmm. now it's July 4th and we've got a concert and you can sit in the back yard and you can barbecue, you can stay in and you can go all out and have a really good time. And that is very, very exciting. And then there are actually no fireworks this year, but aren't they replaying fireworks after the concert? So yeah, that's, that's a how point. I watch them anyway. So it's like not going to be any different for me. <laughs> That's right. There are so many, for every person who goes outside to watch the fireworks live, there are 10 times that many who stay at home and watch them. And that's correct. You know, in consultation with the city of Philadelphia and out of an abundance of caution, we decided to make our entire festival virtual. And that goes for everything that we're going to do, including fireworks. So NBC is going to end the concert with footage of fireworks from last year and previous years, because it wouldn't be July 4th in Philadelphia without fireworks. You're just going to be watching them on television and not live because we want to make sure that we do everything we can to keep people safe. WelcomeAmerica.com seems to be the place we need to be around 4th of July this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, WelcomeAmerica.com is going to be the clearinghouse for all things July 4th. Anybody who visits WelcomeAmerica.com will be treated to a daily schedule of events from morning afternoon and evening. And that is where they're going to go to be able to engage and see everything. And we've got a lot of great partners who've come to the table, right? So you've got the, as I mentioned, the hymns and harmony gospel concert. We've got the United States army field band. We've got the United States army band Pershing's own performing. We've got the Philadelphia orchestra, of course, the great Philly pops every afternoon. We've got amazing, engaging educational programming for young people and for families to enjoy and learn something something along the way. Every morning, we're really excited to kick off every day with our mindful program in partnership with Independence Blue Cross, who's our official health and wellness partner. Every day, they're going to do a segment where they're going to give people tips on how to keep themselves mentally and emotionally healthy while they celebrate and while we, you know, deal with the pandemic and, and everything that is going on in, in our world today, because it's really important to be able to, to recognize that, but also feel good and feel healthy. So, 
morning, noon, and night. WelcomeAmerica.com, our Facebook channel, our Instagram channel, our Twitter, TikTok, all of the above. It's going to be jam-packed, and it's it, there's going to be a lot for people to enjoy. I'm so glad, because as I look on WelcomeAmerica.com, one of my, my biggest attractions for Welcome America is still here, even though it's been remixed. Hoagie Day. <laughs> <laughs> That you are still giving out the hoagies at the stores. That's great. I just wanted to make that. You said even though it's been remixed, <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you take that to the team the next time. We're just remixing. <laughs> That's right, Hoagie Day V two. You know, I appreciate you bringing up Hoagie Day because that was one of the things where we said, look, we're not going to change this festival. We're going to reimagine this festival so that we can keep as many of the tried and true programs that people have come to know and love over the past 28 years. We're just going to deliver them differently. And Wawa Hoagie Day is no exception. We're obviously not going to be out on Independence Mall giving away 45,000 free shorty hoagies. We'll be back next year. Uh, but this year, what's actually happening is all 900 stores across the entire Wawa footprint in six different states are oh. all going to participate in a hoagie build. And what they're going to do is take those hoagies that they build in those stores and deliver them locally to hospitals, nursing homes, first responder stations as a way to say thank you to the people who have stepped up to give back to the community. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a hoagie build across the entire Wawa footprint. And that is a perfect example of how you take something that Philadelphians have come to know and love and you reimagine it, you expand it, and you make it even better. Thanks for coming back and telling us about what has no doubt been a lot of work for you and your team, but something we're all really looking forward to. Well, thank you. It is a lot of work. It's a labor of love and we love doing it. And it's great to be here with you guys today. So we have a lot of things to watch virtually in the next couple weeks. Everybody ready? Get everything charged? Wi-Fi right? I was about to say, I got to work on my internet. Make sure. You do need to work on your internet. <laughs> it's, it's always showing off. It's always fronting on me. I'm like, come on. No, but I'm so proud of us, y'all, because we really had like two bosses on this show today. Like, we yes. had information from then Michael and Sean. Like, that's amazing. And how to make huge pivots. I mean, and, and are doing it in such a big way that it's really going to be cool to see how they pull it off this year. And staying in tune with what's going on in the world and they each have a very different approach, but it resonates, you know? So that's important, it's actionable. We hope Love & Grit resonates. If you like us, tell your friends about us, review us, rate us on Apple Podcasts, and check us out on visitphilly.com. We'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.